Welcome to the Marmalade Partner Webinar Series. I'm Steph Jargle, the Head of Americas for Marmalade, and I'll be your host for this series. The Marmalade Partner Webinar Series is designed to share thought leadership, trends, and tips around the services and integrations that work with the Marmalade Cross-Platform Game Development SDK, and features partners like Flurry, Fortumo, Has Offers, Payment Wall, Exit Games, Game House, and others. We'll start off with 45 minutes of presentation, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. Please feel free to post your comments um, or questions during the presentation in the lower left part of the screen. We'll address these questions just following the presentation. Today's guest speaker is John Wintermeyer, Global Sales Development Manager at Payment Wall. He's going to help make payments human, which will help you understand how to best integrate payments into your games and understand how to optimize for different markets. John? Thanks, Stephanie. So first of all, thanks Marmalade for putting this webinar series together. Uh, today, so I'm presenting from PayMall, based here in San Francisco, and I wanted to let you guys know how to, how to make payments human again for your users. So let's get started. So today, I'm going to go over some points. First, I'll tell you a little bit about PayMall. Then I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, how you're going to find your users. With Marmalade, it's a cross-platform, so you're having users from all over. So it would be great to, to, do, uh, to figure out how to discover your users no matter what platform you're on. And then we're going to look at some of the markets that PayMall is in and some unique markets that maybe you're having issues with uh, with your users and being able to monetize them. And then from that, making the most with your users. Um, so making the most, so making the most revenue, making them the most happy, things like that. And then also customer retention. This is really big in terms of not only the gameplay, but also in payments. And then with the right monetization tools, that's going to talk about some tips and tricks that we have at PaymentWall and other payment platforms that you can do on your own also in making sure that your users are happy paying. And then also since we do have a plugin with Marmalade. I'll just kind of quickly go over how you can integrate Payment Wall into your Marmalade uh, Marmalade game. And then, like Stephanie said, at the end, we'll have go over any questions. So, Payment Wall. What is Payment Wall? We're a leading digital payments platform. Uh, we partner directly with payment options all over the world. <clears throat> this includes payment options in China, Russia, North America, South America, Europe all over to make sure that payments, you're able to accept payments anywhere. I'm located in the San Francisco office, but we also have offices in Las Vegas, Berlin, Amsterdam, Kiev, and Manila. Each of these offices has a local sales team, a local support team, and can provide um, local, not only end user support, but also merchant support. So we support over 20 languages for merchants and users. And 100 plus payment options. This can be optimized for mobile, web, and actually a smart TV also. We're able to do that. Uh, we were started in 2010, and we currently have 30,000 merchants on our platform, and we have developers from over 150 countries. Just to give you an idea of some of the companies that we do work with, uh, we work with merchants all over, uh, including uh, merchants in China, Russia, Europe. Uh, you can see some names. Uh, Alawar, Jimmy, they do a lot of mobile stuff. We work with client-based games, browser-based games, uh, mobile-based games, um, so pretty much anything. And then we can help you monetize it with payment options and also with offers. So first, we're going to talk about finding users. Um, with with discovery, you need to you need to have users to make them to be, have them be able to pay. So how do you how do you really find your users? With with PayMall, what we see is you have to use different channels. We a lot of our merchants are small to medium that we work with, but we also work with large ones. So we know not every merchant is a large merchant. You look at merchants such as Keen with Candy Crush, they're able to do burst advertising. 
what is burst advertising? They will spend upwards of 100,000 a day, at least to be able to get into the top 10 in the app store. Now, not everyone's gonna be able to do that. I'd say most are not able to do that. How do you find creative solutions? Well, a, a big thing is figuring out what your users really want to do. Do referrals, do different channels, finding alternative stores, um, being featured um, in, in different app stores. You, you never know where you're gonna get all your users from. So you have to be open to a lot of different channels. You have to be creative with your team and figure out what's worked with your users. Maybe go out and try and find users in Southeast Asia. If you think, oh, this is, this is a game, let's try targeting there. Sometimes games come out and they don't know how they get users from a certain region, but they do. And so I would make the most of it. So you, you then you find, oh, my game's really popular in Southeast Asia. Let's target that and focus on that. So you want to be open up first, and then later you can tar target it and narrow it down. And by being able to target your users, you're going to be able to find more users. <laughs> and we don't, we don't make the content, but we can help you monetize it. So if you don't have any traffic, um, you're not going to really monetize it. <laughs> so hopefully you're able to uh, find the way to find partners. I'm sure Marmalade has other partners, such as has offers, or even we have an offer wall to acquire users and to find those users and to find out what works and what doesn't. So, so let's say you, you release your game and you have traffic from, from Brazil, from Southeast Asia, some of these different markets that maybe you're not familiar with. With some of the people on the call, they're from all over. So with, with users from the US, they're gonna pay differently than users in Europe. I know they had Fortumo on the webinar about two weeks ago and they focused on a lot of mobile payments. And that's good, mobile payments are good and there's so many other options they can use to help complement that. So first let's look at the, the European market. <clears throat> we actually have two offices in Europe and it has allowed Paymall to attract diverse pool employees and to provide local support and local expertise um, with employees from France, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, Spain. We're able to really know each of these markets. When you look at a market, it's separated by usually a couple of things. One is geography, uh, but two, also the language is a big thing. Language, when a market speaks all a certain language, they have very similar characteristics. Uh, so uh, Germany is a German market. France is a different market than all of Europe. So Europe's tough because there's so many different countries and they all are a little bit different in the payment habits. Uh, but then you look at maybe in South America and you look at the, the Spanish speaking market and they're very similar in the way they, they pay. Uh, Europe is, you look at the breakdown. So this, I will tell you where the numbers came from, just to give you an idea. These numbers are in total processed from our gaming partners. So 30% of the revenue, or 31% to be exact, is the revenue that we see processed through a credit card. Um, this is all of Europe, so it also includes, includes Germany, France, UK, and all these different markets. So it's still a popular option, but then you, let's say you look at North America, which I don't have a pie chart for, but I can tell you off the top of my head, credit card is gonna be three times as high. It's, it's a necessity to have credit card in North America. In, in Europe, yes, you should have it, definitely. But then also to get the most out of your users, you need to have local payment options. These local payment options include mobile. So mobile is great. I can tell you the advantages of each payment option. So mobile, high conversion rate, um, easy to do, uh, very secure. Um, what do you mean by, what do I mean by secure? I mean in a couple ways. One, it's secure for the user. So then compared to credit card, there's gonna be a lot less chargebacks, um, which means there'll be a lot less disputes or penalties for accepting payments via mobile. Once a mobile payment happens, you're gonna collect that amount, um, especially in Europe. Uh, in credit card, a user can have up to six months to issue a, issue a chargeback. 
um, a chargeback would be a dispute saying they never made that payment. Um, sometimes it's called friendly fraud, but to be honest, fraud's never friendly. So um, you want to avoid it at all costs. And then prepaid card it is similar to mobile and being a very safe payment method. Um, it's pretty much a user is paying cash. So once you have the user paying, you're going to be able to walk away with that money. Um, and this is really popular in a gaming market because if you know your demographics, they're going to be a little bit younger. And prepaid cards are great for great for people um, under 18. You go to a store, you get your weekly allowance. A user will go pay ten dollars, get a prepaid card, and then be able to use that prepaid card on your game. Um, and e-wallets and bank transfer kind of tail out. Bank transfer is actually um, quite good in, in Europe. Um, it, it, it fluctuates between how high it is, but 9% is quite high compared to other markets. So, but then you look at it in a specific European country, such as the Netherlands, and you're going to need bank transfer. If you don't have bank transfer in the Netherlands, you're not going to be able to monetize any of your users. Um, or maybe not any, but I would say probably not 50 to 60% of them. So this is something that you have to look at when you go and you're getting traffic from a market is, oh, I have all these users from this market, but am I presenting them the right options? So in Europe, this is a quick breakdown. And then we looked at the t top style of game. So this is what we see in terms of traffic from users on our platform. Uh, we see a lot of people playing casual mobile games in Europe overall. So we just switched to Brazil, go to South America, and it's totally different in the spending habits. You look at it, uh, bank transfer, um, Boleto. So this is the top payment option. So bank transfer and Boleto are, it's an interesting payment option because this is actually where users are paying cash almost. They actually, the, the user flow is this. I, it amazes me the dedication that users will have in Brazil to pay for their game. What they do actually um, is they will print a voucher from their own computer, take it to a local bank or location, and then the person will scan that voucher and then they'll pay there. <clears throat> this, <clears throat> this makes up a large portion of the payments that happen in in Latin or in Brazil. It's, it just means it's good to have this and it just shows how dedicated their users are to your game. So you should have this, you need to have local e wallets and local credit card <clears throat> or is another big thing to actually, so with local credit card is, is where the bank that you work with should be local so it's able to successfully process the transaction. If it's not a local credit card, you're going to get a lot higher declines. You're going to get a lot of frustrated users. So you want to make sure it's local. The issues with Brazil with payments that people do have is, is high fees and high taxes. So just be aware that if you're monetizing in, in Brazil, just be aware of the taxes that you'll have to face the, and also higher fees for mobile. For the Russia CIS region, this is a great gaming market. They have, their, like again I said, the local payment options by language. So Russia uh, CIS is a great market because they love video games. <laughs> they, there's no doubt about it. We have some of the highest traffic is from Russia. Some of the highest uh, average revenue per user is from Russia. Um, they they like free to play games. They like going and using their local payment options. And the great thing about the local payment options in Russia is that they are low fees. There's, so I talk about low fees. So let's make sure you understand that. So when a user pays 10 US dollars or let's say 10 rubles, you're not collecting all those funds. You're, there's a payment system fee which is deducted. But in Russia, the payment system fee is low. It's, it's like credit card, which is usually around 2 to 3% plus a transaction fee of 30 cents. In Russia, the local e-wallet solutions are very similar pricing structure to this, usually under 10%, which is great, considering mobile can go up to 
50, 60, even 70% in some markets. And then you go down the list in Russia and you also see cash. Oh, well, what is cash? How would a user pay cash for a game? Well, there's these payment kiosks. And they'll go to the kiosk and they'll actually, it's like a reverse ATM. They'll go to this kiosk and they'll put money into the kiosk to pay. This is similar to Boleto, but automatic. It's just automated. You, and, it's, and it's great for users and they, they enjoy it. Going on to, to Southeast Asia. These, these four markets I chose because these are the most interesting markets in terms of payments, in terms of alternative payments, because they're all very diverse in what they do, in what they have. And Southeast Asia, very mobile centric. You, you go to Southeast Asia, everyone has a phone. Everyone. Maybe not a laptop, but they'll have a phone. So that gives them just a great payment method right there. They might not have credit cards either, but with the phone, they're able to easily just plug in their phone number, receive the verification, and pay. In this market, they're, they're usually, a lot of them are unbanked. So this is a reason why that mobile and prepaid cards is so high. Uh, you see that credit card is only 3%. I think it's, that's the lowest in the regions for credit card processing uh, that, we, that we have substantial traffic from. Uh, this, this is good to know, but, and then, so then you can look at alternative payment options for your users. And then, you know, now that you know where your users are coming from, you have an idea of what payment methods that should be incorporated or targeted to these users. How do you, how do you really make the most of them? How, how do you know? So, you also have to look at the, the demographics. So this is location, obviously, but it's also uh, gender. So doing testing, doing a lot of promotions, um, having a lot of data that we collect from different games, different platforms, we, we know the characteristics of different buyers. You look at a male buyer compared to a female buyer. Male buyers prefer actually bonuses over over discounts you they have the idea oh it's something free this is great well if you show females discounts they're more susceptible to buying than males so if you're female centric your game is female centric or has more female users you should think about what promotions you want to run what type of promotions And then also the age. So age obviously so affects the payment methods available to this user. Um, so users under 18 aren't going to have credit cards. So what do you have to do? You have to give them other alternative payment options, such as cash payment options, which include prepaid cards, and then also mobile payment methods. So mobile payment methods, even kids have mobile phones now, or people under 18, so it's a great option to have for them. They, they prefer to use cash um, just because they have it. Also, a thing to know too is the age affects when your users are playing games. Uh, they, it affects the time, not only the timing of the day, but also of the year. So you have to look when schools start, when schools end. It actually affects our monetization. We notice it, we're like, oh, okay, school's starting or um, school's ending, summer's out, uh, it's the holidays. So things like that will in, in change the monetization. The best way to really judge your monetization is to look back a year past and to see what kind of events are happening in the real world to know how it's changing. Um, we actually, is a funny story too, is that we noticed a, uh, a dip in monetization when the grant, new Grand Theft Auto game came out. So actually, it, was, it affected a lot of the games, and we noticed and we talked to a lot of the merchants, and they said the user dips dropped right after that game came out. So yeah, so you have to look at not only the age, uh, gender, but also just real world events is, is a huge thing uh, when, you're, when you're working in uh, when you're running or trying to sell to your users. 
and then global expertise. So I know we talk about localized pricing. Everybody talks about localized pricing. Um, so this is just, I'll simply put it, is where you charge a different amount based on the region. Um, this is done to make it more affordable for different users and to make sure you're earning the most money from other users. So for example, in the US, you'll charge one US dollar. In Europe, you can charge one euro. Um, so, but then in the Philippines, uh, usually one US dollar equals 44 Filipino pesos, but you might want to charge 20 Filipino pesos. So what we do on our system is we actually have a button that you just press and it automatically updates it to that and it'll round to whole numbers. So instead of charging maybe 10 US dollars in the US and then 13 or I don't know, it'd be like eight, around like 850 euros in Europe, uh, we would just round it to be exactly 10 euros. This full price point is more attractive to look at. It's easier for the user to understand. They might think, oh, why is it, why am I getting charged 1943 uh, for this price point? Um, no, it should be whole numbers. And then language and currency. So we, we talk about um, the local language of the checkout page and the game. So if a user from, let's say, from the Philippines using US dollars, they might not quickly know the conversion rate. So they have no idea how much they're spending. Who is going to buy something that they don't know how much they're going to pay for it? So you really want to present it in a local currency so they easily understand what it means. Uh, it makes them more users more comfortable to pay and more willing to pay. Um, so this is important to have in your checkout page. We So there's different ways to target and identify where the user is from. So we geo-target that user and we show them the local language and the local currency. Um, this can be, it's very flexible to, to pass on uh, with, uh, with your checkout page. You can pull it from maybe the user's IP, which country are they logging in from, or maybe pull it from their, their browser. Or if you have them sign up and they select the language, oh, I prefer to speak English, then you'll automatically have the user see everything in English. So this is just some tools that you can use um, for your whole entire game, as well as your checkout page. You, it's not, um, not everyone in the world speaks, speaks English. Not everyone in the world speaks uh, Chinese. They all speak different languages, so it's good to cater to your users and to make them comfortable paying. They have to trust you to pay. Um, if they don't trust you, they're not going to pay. Um, local holidays. So I mentioned about local events, local real-world events. So this is true for holidays, too. Holidays are very big in the U.S. and they're also big worldwide, but sometimes they run at different times. Uh, for example, Christmas. Christmas in the U.S. runs differently than, um, or an Orthodox Christmas, which runs later, uh, or first week of January. So look at those and realize when you want to run this promo. We identify top holidays and top merchants that we think will benefit most from a promotion. The Advantage would be Christmas, Black Friday, Valentine's Day. So obviously Valentine's Day is, is great for a dating site. Um, so uh, we, and then for uh, Black Friday is great for gaming sites. What we do is we also want you to announce, we tell, you want to alert your users about this sale. It's like you're leading up to it. They want to get, you want to build up excitement and then right when they want to buy, you want to make sure they buy a lot of it. So, what we do is we have them email users, uh, announcements in forms, announcements on uh, Facebook pages, push notifications, uh, different ways to alert users of this sale. That, that way they, and you don't want to do it too far in advance because then they won't buy anything for a while. But you want to do it at the right time. So usually a week in advance is good, uh, maybe five days. Uh, so they just kind of get ready and then you'll see a jump in revenue by 40%. It's, it's great. Uh, you'll see more traffic and users. Um, you get them excited again to start playing the game to win users back. Yeah, it's a great way also to win users back. Users will leave games so to get them back by running promotions and sales. Um, and yeah, it also increases conversion rate having these sales. Um, you, some tricks to do too is you can um, 
have it set up so during the sale maybe have the default price point a higher price point than normal. Um, instead of having the pre-selected button be on a 10 US dollar price point, have it be on a 20 US dollar price point. Um, you can measure these results um, by just doing, oh, how did the conversion rate do that? How much more revenue did I bring? Um, what about the average revenue per user that day? These are all stats that you should look at, analyze, and then, and then learn from. So next promotion, you're like, oh, I did really well on the 20 US dollar price point. I want to do the same thing on the next promotion. And then keep, keep it simple. So for checkouts, there's a lot of times where there's, there'll be new pop-ups. So actually, what I noticed with some games is I have no idea how to buy something in a game. You want to make it easy for that user. You don't want to make them work to pay. So uh, you once you check into a game, have a very clear button that says buy or uh, more gems or something like that. So that's that's really important uh, to make it easy for them. How? What other tools can you make it easy for them? Well, local language, easy checkout flow. So you want to minimize the clicks. Uh, by each click, you could see a dip in conversion rate by uh, five to ten percent. So you make it easy by just clicking two or three times, no pop-ups. Um, so it, it's something that you want you want to do and make it easy for them. Um, or just a buy now button. You can also do auto refill. So a user dips below Skype does it with their credits. Uh, a lot of people or a lot of different VOIP services do it. So game companies can do it too. So a game a user their credits dip below 200 gold coins, let's say. They can, you can have them automatically refill uh, up to another 1,000 gold coins. So that's just something that's really simple for them. They don't even have to think to do that. You don't want the users to think you want them to do impulse buys. Um, if the more they think about it during the checkout, the less likely they're going to actually make the purchase. And then custom checkout pages. So you want these checkout pages to look like the feel of the game. You're, the user is putting in their payment information. They're going to trust you with this. You don't want to go to some website that you've never heard of, that your web or your maybe your phone or your computer is telling you, oh, this this site's not trustworthy. So you want to make sure that it's built into the game. It looks like the game, and it's not it's not going to scare the user away. For example, we what we do is we take the images from a game or we ask for images and we want to make sure it looks like the game. So you can see in the top left, it's a treasure type game. So with that, they look and they say, oh, okay, this looks cool. There's all these cool graphics that I want. I really want um, these, this, these bonus gems. I really want them. So then what does he do? Maybe he has more bound to click on it than it just saying some boring like, oh, spend $50 and get 500 gems or 750 gems. That it, you want to excite the user and they get them more and more like they still feel like they're in the game. So the, the different ways to do that for different games is, so for, for mobile, you want to make sure it's done in, in an in-app purchase. So you don't want them to have to take away or close the app to make a purchase. You want to make it all done in the app. So with that, you'll load a web view. You on our system it'll load a web view, and then they can easily select the payment option they want to check out. Uh, same with on a, a browser. It'll just it can pop up on a layer on top of the game, and then just easily check out there. So here, and then some special tools that you'll want to look into when you're when you're selecting a payment option. So on the on the right of the screen, you'll see some of the optimized checkout designs. So you look at it, you see, oh, it's it's on it's set for mobile. So the great thing about this is you don't want to have the same checkout design on every system. You look, if you had to enter in um, some of your billing stuff on a, on a phone, it's it's really annoying. You have a smaller screen. It's not as much space to enter in all the buttons. So then what we do is we optimize it per checkout method. So we take the API 
and we make sure that it's optimized for mobile. It has big buttons, it's easy to input, and then it's easy for the user to go back and make changes. And then also, the first point says pure API. Well, well what does that mean? So pure API is something that we can do for some of our payment options, or credit card processing, is make it a pure API, meaning you have control over the way it looks and feels on your site. Now this is the most control you can have, and it's really, it's great for you. It, it gives you so much more flexibility. It really allows you to make it feel like your game. Um, so that's, that's great. Although the pure API, you'll have to do some more, um, you might have to do some compliance uh, with that, but overall, it, it could be worth it if you have the right volume. And then some other tools is to retry payments. So a payment fails, it's frustrating for a user. You had a user so close to paying, or he actually, he wanted to pay, but he couldn't. So then, well, what do you do? So there's different methods that can happen. So what we do is there's also called a, a waterfall. So what does that mean? A waterfall will retry the transactions using different processors. So for different processors, that means for credit cards. So a, Euro, a user from France logs into your game and they're trying to pay and the payment does not go through. So they get some error message, but it's not understandable. So they're gonna not try again. What else you can do too is you can do what's a waterfall. So we'll try and process it on one end and then if it doesn't go through the first processor, try another credit card processor. Uh, we're connected to numerous processors all uh, local in different areas. So if one doesn't work, we'll try another one. Well, what if none of the processors work? Well, you can always try and recommend them another payment option. You can pop up maybe a mobile payment option saying, oh, your credit card didn't work. How about you try this mobile payment method? Um, pretty much whoever has a credit card is gonna have a mobile phone. So they can just plug in their phone number if they, if they still wanna pay. And then that way you can still get a convert a converting user. And then with optimization. So I showed you different regions, I showed you popular payment options. So it's a lot to do with the payment option order. So this can this actually changes by region, but it can also change by merchant. So what we do is with our thirty thousand merchants is we look and we see, we analyze, oh, which payment option is performing best which is converting best. We wanna show that option first. So then when a user opens the screen, we know that they're gonna prefer this payment option. Um, and then they'll click on it and then they'll do the complete checkout. You don't wanna show, we have over 100 payment options in our system. You don't wanna show every user 100 payment options. It's overwhelming. So you wanna show them the top four or five. And then as I talked before, you wanna optimize it for mobile. So Mobile, mobile, mobile is, is great. So you really, you want to take this design and you want to put it into your game and it'll just be a web view, it'll still be in-app. Okay, now that you're, now that you have the tools, you want to keep these customers. Uh, so how do you keep customers? Well, retaining customers is, is important. You have your top 10% of paying users are going to earn about 50% of your revenue. These, these whales are, you want to keep them happy. You want their transactions to go smoothly. You don't, you don't want to lose them. Um, so this can be done by making sure their transactions are successful, making sure it's easy to pay, uh, making sure your game is up to date. Um, I mean, users will eventually move to a new game. So once you have them there, you want to make sure you have them for as long as you can. Uh, know, know how long your users typically play a game. I know when I play games, it's depending on the game, maybe I'll play a game for a month, maybe it'll be three months, maybe six months. It really depends on the game. And once you know the life span of your users, you'll be able to better suit your game for these users. And customer support. So if there ever is an issue with your user's pain, you want to provide easy and local customer support. Um, this is done by local language, done by different channels. Uh, we have users contacting us on 
uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on general emails, on payment support emails, on inquiries. We have so many different channels, phone calls. We have so many different channels to accept user inquiries and they expect answers right away. If the answer is not done in an hour, they're, they're going to be going crazy. They're going to be uh, tweeting about it. They'll go on Facebook. They'll, an unsatisfied user is 10 times, actually for payments, is 20 times more uh, likely to talk about it more than a, just an easy payment. And then when you earn that customer's loyalty with support, they're more willing to pay again. You quickly handle the inquiry. They're like, okay, I understand. Um, this is fine. They, they want to pay. They like your game. So make sure that they're happy the whole time they're paying. Uh, one unsuccessful transaction or one unresolved case could mean that you lost that user. You lost a user that you had that wanted to pay, and now they're not even interested in paying. The, the great thing uh, with, with Pamela is I'll say that you, you have all these payment options, and then users will remember this, remember the brand, and they'll want to use Pamela. They understand that for me to pay, I need these certain payment options. So integrate, or at least integrate this certain payment option, and then you'll have that user's trust again, and you'll have the user be able to pay. So test and test some more. So uh, to maintain customers, you want to find out what works. You know, there's different price points. So how do you, is there an exact science to having price points? No, there isn't an exact science. You, you have to first test. You test certain different price points. You can start at maybe um, having a $10 default price point. Well, why not increase it to 20 just for a week or test it on half your users? Split your traffic. Uh, do A-B testing. You know, they, so there's, when users are paying, they, they value uh, oh, and it's a higher price point. Maybe they think, oh, this is a great service. I have no problem paying for this. But you, you have to measure and take into account, obviously, total revenue, but then also conversion rate. So you want to have a find the sample of conversion rate compared to um, uh, combined with revenue uh, to make sure that your users are able to afford it and able to pay and then keep paying. Um, and then you can keep testing up and up the price point until you see a drop off in conversion. And then you'll, you'll find your sweet spot. Um, and then check, monitor your stats, check your traffic. Well, see when you're experiencing a lot of traffic. So um, revenue, obviously, on weekends for games usually goes up. So you'll know that you'll experience a, an increase then. And then also, don't become uh, robotic in sales. So you look at maybe merchants who have done sales every Sunday. Well, they're only going to get users to pay on Sunday. So you want to do sales, but don't do them in a pattern and you're going to, because then users are just going to wait until a, 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 an item or your currency is on sale. And then <clears throat> monitor competitors too. So this is good. You always want to keep track of what your competitors are doing. Are they, have they added a new payment option or, <clears throat> Or what are, what are their users preferring to do? You can look at the feedback of their users. And then if you look at their feedback, you can see, oh, um, they don't, they don't like this. And I thought about doing that, uh, for their game. So it's, it's always good to know what's happening in the marketplace. And then, um, watch, watch for fraud. So fraud is, happens a number of ways. So it can happen. Like I said before, friendly fraud. So this is just means a user tricked your system. So they, they paid with a credit card. A month later, they said, oh, we're not happy with the product after they, after they got tired of your game. And then they issue a chargeback. So that means the credit card company is going to take away the, that $10 and also fine you $15. So, so how do you, you can't control that. Fraud is going to happen. It's unavoidable but you can minimize it. So if a user does that, you can, well, one, you should ban that user. You should tag that user and say, oh, since they issued a chargeback, you, they're considered a risky user, especially on your platform. 
uh, so then you, you shouldn't accept that. Accept them as another user or another repeat buyer. There's also, um, for watching for fraud, you can also look at their payment behavior. So you want to look at ticket size and um, transactions. So if they usually make $10 transactions and all of a sudden a, a one day they make $300 traction, transactions in a row, well, that's most likely too good to be true. So uh, be careful with that. And then, ha so how do you fight that? So there are risk solutions out there. There are, and I always talk to your payment company too. Oh, what do you do for risk? Well, they will give you maybe similar answers and how they, they fight it, but you really need to look at their policies, make sure they actually have a risk team, maybe check um, LinkedIn and actually see and make sure they have a risk team to, to fight fraud. And then here, here are some more points that you want to make sure when you're um, looking at payment options. So risk management I just talked about, uh, dealing with fraud. Uh, load time. You want to make sure the widget loads quickly um, so they don't have to wait. So when I click buy, instantly the payments page will appear and I'm able to put in my payment information. Uh, this is done by making sure you have servers um, all over the world or at least close to where your users are. Um, and then mobile versus web for smart TV. There are different platforms. There are different UIs. So make sure your payments page is a different UI for each of these platforms. Uh, you can easily identify which system the user is coming from. So then just make sure that whatever system or um, tool they're coming from, they actually show the correct uh, checkout page. No surprises. This is no surprises for the end user in uh, hiding fees. So when you look and you buy, you sometimes they'll add on fees for different payment options and they call it a convenience fee. I, I always say, well, it's not very convenient for the user. So make sure that you're not, or you try not to put on these conveniencies. I, I, we see a drop in conversion by 20, 30%. And it's, it's, it gives a bad taste in the mouth for, for end users um, on why they're getting charged that. Um, trust, uh, you obviously are accepting their payments, so you have to do trust. Do certifications, uh, make sure your site is HTTPS. Um, this is it's different by each region too. So it's, um, I can tell you in, in Germany, they're very um, secure in the way they do payments. And they will ask a lot of questions uh, before they even make a payment, we get user inquiries asking if we were safe to make payments with just before um, before they do make a payment. So it's it's, it's you want to make sure that they feel comfortable paying. Um, confirmation. So you once they pay, send them a receipt. Make sure they know that they what they got their product they were asking for and that they're happy with it. Um, custom UI design. You want to like I said, you want to have a custom checkout page for these for your users to make it easy for them to pay. Um, and then easy and quick integration. So you look at over, we have 100 payment options. I can tell you this didn't happen overnight. You sign contracts with these payment options. They have long, long agreements. You want to make sure that they didn't trick you. So when you sign an agreement, look through it carefully and then test the payment first. Maybe test a couple payments and then receive your payout and make sure your number is matched there. And then finding the right monetization tool. So you want the options to be flexible. Uh, you make a cool game, make sure that it fits your needs now and in the future. You wanna grow with it. So make sure you're not just filling a need now. And then a year from now, you have to integrate, negotiate and do all this stuff again. Uh, you want to find a long-term partner and, and do not settle. Uh, there's so many times I've heard, oh, I, they said they could do this, but it turns out they can't. Well, you can't really control if somebody is not telling you the truth, but um, you should be able to know what you need and what you cannot live without. So don't settle and then think, oh, I'm going to be totally fine with this payment option, but then in the end, you're running into more problems and you're having to do more work on your end. So it's not saving you any time on money. And then I can tell you for paywall pricing, you want to make sure it's simple. 
uh, we just operate on a revenue share. So this, I'm sure you hear a lot, especially as a startup, because you, or not a startup, but maybe a small to medium developer, you might not have huge capital uh, to invest in right away or to pay for things. So a revenue share could be beneficial. And since when Paywall works with, with uh, usually smaller developers, we usually give a growth time of six months when you start off. So we'll give you a lower rate um, to start, which can be anywhere from 3 to 5%. And then with the integration, um, it, it can be found on the Marmalade documentation page. If you go there and then from there, you can set up a Paywall merchant account and make sure you want to sign up through the Marmalade link uh, just to make sure the rates are set up correctly and that also um, the plugin works correctly. So it's easy to set up. And usually we can have merchants live the same day they sign up. So it's very quick and it's very easy. And we, we um, are working in all seven global offices. So we're all, there will be always somebody there to answer your questions. We have a question that just came in. Uh, the question from Maria in Germany is, um, you talked about uh, how users can convert real money to in-game currency. Do you know of any products that allow games to pay out real money to users as an achievement reward? Okay. Yeah, Maria, this is a good question, actually. Uh, so this is usually used, uh, obviously, with a lot of uh, gambling sites, uh, but then also could be skill gaming. Um, so with this, it's, um, and what is skill gaming? Skill gaming is when you usually compete against another user and then the winner will take an, um, home a, a real cash value. And we actually worked with um, GameDuel in doing this. Um, so the tools you'll need, so there's different providers. So I can tell you how our system would work in this. We uh, usually, the payout works, so we'll collect the funds and we'll pay out you directly and then you can pay the end users. Um, there are also, we have partners too that um, usually they use, and what they use is they usually use the e-wallet. So you make it set up with either Skrill or PayPal and uh, send it to the user. So that's that's how you would do it. Um, it's definitely, it's, there are is some more risk uh, when real money is involved, but it's, um, it's definitely impossible to, to do. Are there any recent changes in um, in like new laws that uh, have recently gone into effect that anyone should be aware of that you are kind of on your okay. radar? So yeah, so we're I can tell you we're a U.S. company. Uh, so with that, the government is actually slow in the U.S. If you guys didn't know, <laughs> so it's always not changing quite up to speed with online payments. Um, that being said, there are licensing licenses that. Um, we have to make sure that we are um, that we are able to comply with laws. And I'm surprised actually nobody asked about bitcoins. Um, so bitcoins, I'm sure most of you know, is a virtual currency that's not backed by any government. Um, and this um, is something that the U.S. government uh, doesn't like, <laughs> um, but it's something that a lot of online merchants have accepted. Um, and you can accept that. And usually I can tell you when I talk to online merchants, it's, it's usually about three to 5% of their online revenue. So that's uh, something if you're looking at Bitcoins ever uh, to take into account that it's not really mainstream yet, but it's uh, an option that um, we're, that we could possibly look into helping you with. There's a question from Chanley in San Francisco. Is uh, what allowed Payment Wall to become so successful to establish many global offices and acquire so many men merchants? So yeah, so yeah. it's with Payment Wall. So what allowed us to uh, to grow? Um, so when I joined Payment Wall, I've been at Payment Wall for two and a half years. Uh, we started off in San Francisco and Kiev, where our first two offices. And people say, oh, why do you have so many offices? And as a payments company, it's important to know the laws and regulations for each of these markets. So um, with each of these markets, we were able to open offices just by hiring locally and then by by being close to merchants. So we opened the offices in, in Germany and Istanbul around the same time because we provided, we wanted to provide not only local merchant support, but also local user support. Um, so that, that 
allowed us to grow, we kind of followed our merchants, to be honest, uh, where they were located. So that's why I, later this year, early next year, we'll have offices in Brazil and also um, in Russia. Let's see. I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, so I want to um, thank you all for joining us. And thanks, uh, thanks, Sean, for the great presentation and great information. It's been very, um, I think, insightful for everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you on our next webinar. Uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, Stephanie and Marmalade. It's been great.